Good afternoon, colleagues. The first item of business this afternoon is portfolio questions, and the portfolio on this occasion is social justice. As ever, I would remind uh, members wishing to ask a supplementary to press the request to speak buttons during the relevant question. There is quite a bit of interest in asking questions through this session, so uh, the usual appeal for brevity in questions and responses. And I call question number one, Paul Sweeney. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what action it has taken to mitigate any impact of the Illegal Migration Act on the provision of support for refugees, asylum seekers and displaced people living in Scotland. Minister Emma Roddick. The Scottish Government is vehemently opposed to the Illegal Migration Act. UK Government plans to implement the Act remain unclear, which makes it very challenging for uh, the Scottish Government to consider what action may be possible to take. We are um, assessing the scope of mitigations that are available within devolved competence. We continue to deliver a range of interventions wh which mitigate the impact of cruel and humane UK Government immigration policy. That includes through our New Scots Refugee in Integration Strategy, the Ending Destitution Together strategy, the trafficking and exploitation strategy and the Scottish Guardianship Service. We recently launched our paper on migration in an independent Scotland, which sets out our approach to migration, which is based very much on the values of dignity, fairness and respect. Paul Sweeney. Whilst this Act is the product of the UK Tory Government, the impacts will be felt in devolved areas in Scotland, including protections for human trafficking and children. I understand the Scottish Government has been working with stakeholders on a plan to mitigate these impacts over the summer, as the Minister mentioned. So will she confirm beyond the strategies outlined in high level what steps the Scottish Government will take to strengthen human trafficking and child protection measures? And we should set out a clear timeline for those specific interventions which are urgently required. Minister. Um, I appreciate very much that the, this is a, an issue that the member takes great interest in. And indeed, I remember him attending the Illegal Migration Summit, which, which we held to explore potential mitigations at that stage. But as I explained in my previous answer, without knowing the detail of how this Act is to be implemented, it is very difficult for us to come up with specific measures to uh, mitigate the worst impacts, but more than happy to carry on our engagement both with the member uh, and the, the wider stakeholder policy area to, to make sure that we're on top of what, what we can possibly do within devolved competence. And supplementary, Karen Adam. Thank you, Sign Officer. As the recent Building a New Scotland paper on migration demonstrates that the only realistic way for refugees and asylum seekers to receive the support they need from day one of arrival is with the full powers of an independent state. How transformational does the Minister believe it would be for asylum seekers to be granted the right to work in an independent Scotland? Minister. Uh, having the right to work and without limitation to the, the shortage occupation list would be absolutely transformational uh, for people seeking asylum in Scotland. And we recognise that access to employment can support people to settle, integrate, enable them to use their skills and experience. Uh, rebuild confidence, expand social networks, reduce the risk of poverty and indeed reliance on government support uh, while also contributing to our economy and our communities. Of course, Scotland's already seen an enormous valuable contribution to economy and our communities with refugees and displaced Ukrainians uh, have the right to work from the day they arrive or are granted refugee status. Earlier this year, we commissioned our expert advisory group on migration and population to explore the potential impacts of right to work for asylum seekers in Scotland, and we do expect that report to be published very shortly. Question two, Colin Smith. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to calls from Age Scotland and others to improve plans for the new pension age disability payment by including extra mobility and travel support for recipients. Cabinet Secretary. I look forward to meeting Age Scotland as I share their aim to meet the needs of older people in Scotland, and that is why my priority is the safe and secure transfer to pension age disability payment after launch. Although this limits fundamental changes to the existing rules, I am determined to ensure pension age disability payment is delivered with dignity, fairness and respect. This is in sharp contrast to the UK Government, who are taking money away from disabled people and threatening them with sanctions, as announced once again in the autumn statement, actions which I wrote to the DWP with about on Friday. Colin Smith. Thank you, President. No, so the Cabinet Secretary will know that a mobility component is available to disabled people below pension age in receipt of disability-linked social security, such as personal independence payment and child and adult disability payment, but it is not available to those above pension age, which is arguably ageist. Such a component could potentially give disabled 
people access to, for example, mobility schemes, uh, automatic rights to the blue badge, and an opportunity to apply for exemption from vehicle tax. And crucially, it will enhance their independence, their well-being, and relieving pressure on other services. Surely that's something the Cabinet Secretary thinks we should be encouraging. Cabinet Secretary. So we have undertaken significant work exploring the feasibility of introducing a mobility component during the early development of PADP, and our analysis found it could cost an additional £580 million annually. I think during this challenging fiscal environment, it is important for us uh, to set out the costs of proposals that are coming forward. Uh, we also have to bear in mind the risk of um, deviation significantly from attendance allowance, given the fact that those in receipt of attendance allowance or PADP um, are automatically passported to a range of reserved benefits and premiums, and this may be under risk if we deviate significantly. In saying all of that, though, Presiding Officer, I am very keen to continue to work with stakeholders, which is why I will be meeting Age Scotland soon to discuss their campaign. Thank you. A couple of supplementaries. First, Jeremy Balfour, who joins us online. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Cabinet Secretary, Without a car, many older and disabled people, especially in rural areas, struggle with transportation as local bus services are too infrequent and not suitable for wheelchair users. Does the Minister not agree that a mobility scheme in these areas is now essential? Cabinet Secretary, I'm, con I'm concerned the audio wasn't great. Did you pick up enough of that to be able to respond? I, I think I did. Can I begin, as I did at committee yesterday, uh, by um, um, saying that I'm pleased that Jeremy Balfour is still able to take part in proceedings, and I look forward to welcoming him back um, into the chamber uh, soon um, after his operation. But I wish him well for now, as I'm sure colleagues in the rest of the chamber do. I did uh, say during my um, original answer that there is a significant cost to the um, allocation of uh, a mobility component uh, to PADP, and I do think that is something that we need to bear in mind, as I'm sure Mr Balfour will, when they come forward with costal proposals, should he wish any changes as the regulations go through Parliament. And Evelyn too. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can the Cabinet Secretary explain what additional improvements recipients of the devolved pension age disability payment will experience compared to the DWP's attendance allowance? Cabinet Secretary. Well, despite the fact that it is difficult, particularly before case transfer is completed, to make fundamental changes, there are still differences being made, presiding officer, including a more inclusive application channels, in-person support from our local delivery service, and streamlining routes to set up third-party representatives. We will significantly, of course, improve uh, the way that we work uh, the PADP, as we have done with all the benefits that we have devolved to Social Security Scotland. Question three, Edward Mighton. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what single-use items will be removed from the baby box in light of the Circular Economy Scotland Bill. Cabinet Secretary. The Circular Economy Bill will establish a legislative framework to support Scotland's transition to a zero waste and circular economy, including measures to reduce consumption of single-use items. Scotland's baby box is providing essential items for the first six months of a baby's life. A small number of essential single-use items are provided to support the health and well-being of mothers and babies, such as breast pads and maternity towels. All items provided in the baby box are kept under review to ensure that they are meeting the needs of babies, parents and the latest clinical advice. Edward Mayne. And I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response. Given the limited positive impact on new mothers and infants of the baby box, as laid out in the Lancet, does the Cabinet Secretary believe that ensuring adequate maternity services in rural hospitals such as Murray and Caithness are available to local mums are as important? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, local maternity services are important, but I am genuinely disappointed uh, that at a time where we are seeing uh, more countries uh, coming to Scotland and asking about the experience of the baby box, looking to see how they can learn from that and develop them in their own countries, we have yet to convince um, the Conservatives about the importance of this. And that is very, very um, unfortunate, President Officer, when you look at the evaluation of the baby box, which highlights the positive impacts the scheme has had on families, particularly for first-time younger and low-income parents. Got a couple of supplementaries, hopefully briefly. First, Kenneth Gibson. Yes, thank you, Presiding Officer. And does the Cabinet Secretary share my astonishment at the Tories' long-standing and curmudgeonly view of the baby box? And can she advise how many babies have received the baby box since it was introduced and how it is being received by parents? Cabinet Secretary. 
Well, I hear Mr Mountain still saying, accusing me of spin, presiding officer. I'm sorry that uh, quoting an independent evaluation of the BB box is described uh, as a uh, spin, but there we go. But Mr Gibson is quite right to point to the success um, of uh, the BB box. Um, indeed, it's the only one that's available in the UK, and I'm delighted that since its inception, 282,341 babies born in Scotland have benefited from the baby box and that independent evaluation of parents shows that there is a high level of satisfaction, 97% satisfaction indeed with the box and the contents with 91% of families reporting financial savings, something I'm disappointed that Mr Mountain doesn't think is a success. And briefly, Co-Cab Stewart. Uh, thank you. Um, I, I absolutely am not alone in having seen a great deal of positive social media attention directed towards Scotland's baby box. What assurances can the Cabinet Secretary give that the Scottish Government will continue to monitor the way that the baby box is received and ensures it stays at the forefront of international best practice? As briefly as possible, Cabinet Secretary. Well, as I mentioned previously, President Officer, it is pleasing to see that there are a number of countries that are looking to Scotland to see what they can learn from that, and we look forward to working with international partners on that. Thank you. Question four, Sarah Boyack. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and can I apologise for arriving slightly late into the Chamber this afternoon to ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on what plans it has to review property factor legislation. Minister Paul McLennan. As I said in my written reply to the member's question, in August this year, the Scottish Government has already revised the Code of Conduct for Property Factors in August 2021 to make it clearer, to drive up standards and to improve transparency and consistency. There is evidence that the Property Factors Scotland Act 2011 is working as intended. Nevertheless, I have asked my officials to look at the operation of the property, fact a property factor sector to see what more can be done to promote an ongoing improvement in standards in line with the requirements currently set out in legislation. Sarah Boyack. Can I thank the Minister for that answer and say that my inbox is increasingly full of issues relating to property factors, from the difficulties of setting up and operating residence associations, inaccurate invoices from factors, complaints to factors going ignored, and issues in relation to the costs of ma landscape management. It is clear there is a growing problem in Edinburgh and the Lothians. So will the Minister therefore commit to meet with me to discuss these issues more fully and look at both the legislative and other solutions which could be used to fix these issues for homeowners, which I have to say just keep increasing in number? Minister. Yeah, I'd be delighted to meet with Sarah Boyack to discuss the specific concerns she has. There is a process in place, as she knows, around about if a phone owner isn't happy, around about applying to the first tier tribunal for Scotland, obviously in terms of that, but I'm more than happy to pick up the specific issues and meet with the member. Thank you. And a supplementary, Craig Hoy. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. As Mr McLennan knows only too well, East Lothian and Mid Lothian are two of the fastest growing areas in Scotland. But sadly, many families buying or renting in new developments are being hit by unexpected or higher than anticipated factor bills. Companies have been accused of overbilling, not doing maintenance work, and in some cases, in his own constituency, of coercing and bullying residents into changing to more expensive weed killing solutions which weren't necessary. Isn't it time that the Scottish Government took a stand through tougher regulation and told rogue operators to factor off? Yeah. Minister. Uh, again, just referring back to my previous answer, I've asked officials to look at the operation of the, of the sector, and I'll certainly raise the points that uh, Mr Hoy has raised, and again, happy to meet you to, to discuss that, Mr Hoy. Question five, Ruth Maguire. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what Scottish social security support is available for terminally ill people and their carers. Cabinet Secretary. We ensure disability benefit applications for terminally ill people are fast-tracked so they receive the support they deserve as quickly as possible. People who are terminally ill automatically receive the highest rates of disability assistance and there are no award reviews. Awards are backdated so people will be paid from the day they became entitled. And I can confirm that care support payment launched in three pilot areas last week is available to people caring for someone with a terminal illness. When delivered nationally, this new benefit will be paid to over 80,000 Scottish carers. Ruth I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Members will have been moved by the Dying in the Margins exhibition last week, which highlighted the crippling injustice and inequality faced by some of our citizens at the end of their life. Can I ask if the Scottish Government will consider making any additional support with energy bills also available to those with a terminal diagnosis? And further to that, will the Cabinet Secretary join me and Marie Curie in calling on the UK Government to give terminally ill people of working age early access to their state pension? pensions that they have paid into and are meant to be there for all at the end of life and could prevent some of them from spending their final days in poverty. Cabinet Secretary. 
Uh, can I thank Ruth McGuire for this uh, very important uh, question that she is raising today. Recognising the pressures on household budgets, we have increased the winter, payment, winter heating payment by 10.1 per cent uh, for winter 23-24, and the fuel and security fund tripled by the First Minister is available to terminally ill people and households at risk of self-rationing or self-disconnecting. Terminally ill children receive the child winter heating payment. Unfortunately, as Ms Maguire well knows, the Scottish Government does not have control over the state pension age um, or issues to do with that, but I would join her in her um, asks of the, Scottish, uh, of the UK Government. Uh, it is a very uh, fair uh, um, ask, uh, and I do not think, quite frankly, too much uh, that, the, uh, that the UK Government um, uh, to, to be able to achieve that. Uh, however, we have also called on the UK Government to urgently introduce a social tariff mechanism as well in relation to energy to support vulnerable consumers and to ensure social security payments are sufficient to meet people's needs. Thank you. A couple of brief supplementaries. Miles Briggs. Thanks, first. Deputy Presiding Officer. The cost of running vital medical equipment like a ventilator can be £26 a month, a humidifier £15 a month, oxygen concentrator £61 a month and an air mattress can cost up to £22 a month to run. The former First Minister said that she would work to make sure that these costs would be covered. Has that happened? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I can confirm that patients using home oxygen concentrators are fully reimbursed for the energy costs associated with running that equipment, but Mr Briggs's question was uh, in wider um, than that. Um, he has raised this point with me before, quite rightly. It's something he is uh, keen to see action on. Uh, I would be more than happy uh, to meet with him to discuss this in detail. I do recognise the points that he makes uh, about the additional costs. I would say to him, though, um, this will be required to come from the uh, pretty much fixed budget that we have within the Scottish Government. And Paul Kane. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I was pleased to lead members' business on the Dying in the Margins report that Ruth Maguire referenced. And also last week, we saw the State of Caring report for 2023 that showed there are gaps that people who are in receipt of um, certain income replacement benefits um, can't access a carer's allowance supplement because they're not in receipt of carer's allowance. So I wonder, has the government taken any assessment of the number of carers in Scotland, particularly those supporting someone with a terminal illness, who might be falling through the cracks in the system and the impact that it's having on them? Cabinet Secretary. Well, as uh, Mr Cain well knows, we are looking to make improvements to the carer support payment as we bring that in. Um, and uh, some of those, uh, for example, at launch date was around those uh, carers who are in full-time education. Uh, we are, of course, looking to do more on this issue. And I'm again happy to work with Mr O'Kane to hear more um, about uh, the situations which he has uh, talked about today. Um, and this may, be, of course, have to be done after the case transfer is complete. Uh, but it is something that I do take very seriously. Um, and we are keen to make sure that we're doing everything to support carers, uh, particularly those uh, who are supporting someone with a terminal illness. Question six, Jackie Dunbar. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what recent uh, correspondences it had with the UK Government regarding any impact on its housing policies in Scotland of local housing allowance rates. Minister Paul McLennan. Freezing local housing allowance amounted to an estimated cut of £819 million over three years. It dramatically reduced support for low-income households in the private rented sector, putting people at risk of homelessness. Ministers wrote to the UK Government urging they reconsider the freeze in May and November this year and to previous Secretary of State each of the previous freeze uh, free years. It is deeply frustrating that the UK Government has taken so long to reverse this damaging cut, which sadly we have all seen the consequent uh, damage from. We sincerely hope a freeze is never considered again. Jackie Dunbar. While the end of the UK Government's three-year freeze on local housing allowance rates is welcome, there is no denying that this policy led to a brutal shortfall between housing benefits and the actual cost of renting a home, as proven by the Chartered Institute of Housing. Does the Minister agree that the autumn statement simply does not go far enough to support financially stretched tenants in Scotland, leaving it to the Scottish Government yet again to pick up the pieces and mitigate against Tory welfare cuts? Minister. I, I would agree that the autumn statement does not go far enough and hinders the efforts of the Scottish Government in our core mission to tackle poverty and prevent homelessness. An estimated £819 million as said, has been lost due to the three-year LHA freeze. The Scottish Government are spending £84 million on discretionary housing payments this year alone to mitigate bedroom tax and benefit cap. We will continue supporting those impacted by damaging UK Government welfare cuts. But if we did not have to spend so much mitigating these, we could further invest in anti-poverty actions 
to better support Scottish tenants. Question 7, Stuart McMillan, who joins us remotely. Uh, thank you, President Officer, to ask the Scottish Government when it last met with Inverclyde -like Council to discuss any impact of depopulation on the Greenock and Inverclyde constituency. Minister Emma Roddick. Um, in addition to the Scottish Government COSLA Population Policy Roundtable, which comprises all local authorities, we have undertaken extensive engagement with depopulating West Coast uh, local authorities throughout the development of our Addressing Depopulation Action Plan, which has formed a key part of wider programme of both official and ministerial level engagement to inform the plan. Most recently, officials met with the Chief Executive of Inverclyde Council on the 8th of November as an opportunity for Inverclyde Council to further shape and provide feedback on its draft contents in advance of publication. Stuart McMillan. I thank the Minister for that reply. And the Minister is very much aware of the depopulation challenge that Inverclyde has faced and will continue to face as the projections indicate this is only going to worsen over time. Now, even though decisions taken by local government have a role to play in making people want to stay or relocate to an area, the Scottish Government also have a role, and does the Minister agree with me that all public bodies should consider, as a first principle, Inverclyde to be the destination for future investment to help address the decline? Minister. Uh, the Scottish Government acknowledges the distinct challenges that Inverclyde and some other urban areas in Scotland are experiencing in relation to population decline, and that's why urban depopulation is one of the core components of our forthcoming Addressing Depopulation Action Plan. We are working with Inverclyde Council to support the design and delivery of key interventions which will support people to move to or continue living in the local area and will look to be led by local priorities in deciding the shape of that work, upholding the principles of the Verity House Agreement during the first phase of a targeted programme of work to address depopulation. And question eight, Alexander Burnett. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking with Social Security Scotland to help with the heating costs of households in the North East, uh, and I refer members to my register of interest regarding energy supply. Cabinet Secretary. This winter we will invest £22 million in our new winter heating payment to provide targeted reliable support to people most in need of help with their heating costs each winter. This includes those on a low income who are disabled, have young children or are older. This is in addition to our child winter heating payment, which is only available in Scotland and provides families of severely disabled children and young people with much needed financial support to help mitigate the additional heating costs that they face in the winter months. Both winter heating payment and child winter heating payment have been uprated this winter by 10.1% in recognition of the ongoing pressure on household budgets. Alexander Burnett. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Now, last December, the UK experienced its coldest day since December 2010, with Braemar the coldest place recorded. Uh, yet my constituents now only receive a one-off winter fuel payment of £55.05p, when previously they received around three times more under the UK's cold weather pavement. Uh, communities across the North East have already experienced snow this year, and this payment will do nothing to support them with their energy bills. So will the Cabinet Secretary reform the winter fuel payment to bring it in line with the support pro provided by the UK Government? Cabinet Secretary. Well, in essence, what the member is um, asking us to do is uh, take money away from people this uh, year. And I will give an example, presiding officer of this. In 21-22, 11,000 people qualified for uh, the DWP, and uh, that totalled 325... Cabinet Secretary, could you resume your seat a second? Mr Lumsden, I have warned you about uh, sedentary interventions. Could you please be quiet? Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, President Officer. I'll uh, start uh, again. 11,000 people received the DWP version of this in 21-22. That totalled £325,000. In 22-23, 394,135 people benefited from the Social Security version of this payment. That is an investment of just under £20 million. So, in effect, uh, in, 20, in the year that this was devolved uh, last winter. 10,000 winter heating payments were made to people in Aberdeenshire alone. That's pretty much what the Conservatives managed to pay for the whole of Scotland in the last year that they were responsible for the benefit. And brief supplementary, Claire Hawley. Winter heating payment recipient, uh, recipients will begin receiving support in the coming weeks with a reliable winter payment that doesn't rely on erratic weather conditions as the DWP's cold weather payment did. Can the Cabinet Secretary lay out how many more households are likely to benefit from the devolved Scottish system this winter compared to the old system? 
And briefly, Cabinet Secretary. Now, some of this I've just, uh, just laid out, Presiding Officer, so uh, I will uh, stick to the very important summary that this is something which people can depend on under uh, the Scottish Government, unlike under the DWP and the UK Government. That is because we do recognise that there are many people on low incomes uh, that do suffer uh, fuel poverty and do need some extra assistance, but that's exactly why there will be around 400,000 individuals with an ongoing investment of £22 million pounds that the Scottish Government is putting into this over this winter. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. That concludes portfolio questions. There will be a brief pause before we move on to the next item of business to allow front benches to change.